Season four, episode four of The Chosen. After episode three, there was a lot of heartbreak, a lot of hardship for everybody involved through the end of that episode. Obviously, the death of a big character within the show, someone who's not biblical, but also it caused a huge stir within the community in general. A bunch of people that are angry about it, a bunch of people that are sad about it, a bunch of people that don't really know what to do. They're trying to figure out what is going on here. But... <laughs> Definitely, this has been an interesting kind of transition from episode three into episode four. And now we're seeing a lot of different things happening here. But most importantly, we're seeing some really um, hard consequences from episode three. So that's where we're going to start, right where they go up to Teldor. And we're going to begin uh, in this section here. So let's go. Teldor. We're almost there, just up ahead. This is only the beginning. I have no idea how I'm going to approach Kafni. So remember the Plains of Sharon, right, is where both Rayma and Thomas are from. Remember, Thomas started to work for Kafni in this business, uh, trying to basically be this catering company, hiring along Rayma and working together essentially uh, in doing these different events and weddings and different things. And so Teldor is where Rayma's from specifically. We're not exactly told where Thomas is, is from, like if he's from that town or if he's from a nearby area. Um, but we do see that there's definitely a connection here. He probably would have been to Teldor several times in order to visit the vineyard or to talk to Kafni or to do business with Rayma, right? And so we're definitely seeing that um, play out a little bit here as he's, I'm sure, going to know a lot of people in this village. You may not have to. Yep. So we see two groups of people there. I'll kind of back it up a little bit. We see two groups of people here. Uh, the first group, obviously, is Kafni, and this could be Rayma's family here. We know from previous episodes of The Chosen, previous seasons of The Chosen, that she at least has one brother, uh, and we don't really know about her mom or any anybody else in her family, but this could be the closest people to her. So maybe these are her cousins and her brother uh, and, and people that are you know the closest to her. And then the people behind them over there seems like still a full group of men. I don't really see any women in that group. And so they're probably here just in case something goes wrong to defend Kafni and his family would be my guess here. Um, but they obviously are approaching them before they get to the town because they do not want them to enter the town here. Thomas, I'll talk to them. I stay back here. I'll take care of it. No, this is mine to do. I can't let you shield me from this. We'll just ask them what they want and report back. Okay. It's all right, see. Thomas, I will go with you. We will face them together. Yeah, I'd be terrified too. Like, what, what am I supposed to do? Especially during this time, like, is he going to want to kill me? Like, what's happening here? I promised him that I'd protect his daughter, and yet I couldn't. There's a lot of hard things here. Where is she? Where is my daughter? That's pretty visceral, actually showing Rayma's face here and seeing uh, Kafni's response to it. Uh, it's pretty rough. And you can see even Thomas doesn't even want to look at her or his response to it. Uh, he's having a rough time. It also looks like Kafni hasn't slept. You can kind of see in his makeup here, his the bags under his eyes and the dark circles around his eyes. Um, yeah, you can definitely see he's in turmoil even before they arrived.
Now the family comes and grabs uh, the cart and begins to go. We can also see, I'll just point out real fast, we have obviously all the apostles, the women who follow in the group, and then we also have Barnaby and Shula as part of this group as well. We've never really seen them travel with anybody like this before, but of course they knew Rayma, they were close to her, and they were very invested in Thomas and Rayma's relationship, so it makes sense that they'd be here. And then I'll point out here as well, once we get to a good point to stop, right here, you'll notice that Thomas this whole time obviously has had a different coat on. Now, a lot of the apostles, basically every single one of them changes outfits throughout the season. Some of those are for specific reasons. Some of those are to show like growth and change, I think, uh, as a character development type thing. For Thomas specifically, this is a pretty big deal because during episode three, he actually takes off his outer cloak and uses it to hold onto Raymond wound uh, earlier on than this when we're going to the flashbacks of what happens right after Rayma dies we actually see that Thomas still has the blood on his hands and he hasn't been able to do anything since she passed away and he's not wearing the coat during that time that's because it's obviously covered in blood and they're probably using it to uh, help cover her up right and so now he has a completely different coat that he's going to wear I think for the rest of the season here um, and it's it's much different right it's much less colored than it was before it's not it's way less bright than it was before i call this thomas emo thomas and <laughs> you'll see more of that throughout this season um joey vahedi in particular does an amazing job this season with a lot of the acting moments that he has not just in this episode but even throughout the rest of the half of the season so there's a lot of really cool things but this it indicates a change of character for him it indicates that he is no longer the same person he was just last episode thomas stop You will proceed no further. You are forbidden to enter this town. Cutney, we are in mourning with you. We grieve, but we are not dangerous. Then why is my daughter dead? Dead! I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You've already killed me, Tomas. And then you went and killed her. You did this. I blame myself. I'm sorry. I failed in my promise. Thomas loved Rayma dearly, Kafni. And she loved him. What are your words worth? You are a fraud and a devil. Deceptive sorcerer. The biggest disappointment in my life is that I didn't teach my daughter better. This is an interesting point, too. I'm wondering why nobody stayed behind to, like, help Kafni in case there was a, a, a fight or a struggle or something like that. They obviously see these people as dangerous. Otherwise, they wouldn't come out as uh, in such force as they did here um, to bring Rayma back in. So I wonder why nobody stayed with him to kind of protect him, or maybe they just thought that, you know, it's all handled now. She had a brilliant mind until you cast a spell on her. Rayma was murdered by a Roman, Kafni. And you don't speak for her. She loved Jesus. She felt her calling was an honor. And she wanted everyone to know that, including you. Yep. I love this moment with Peter as well, how he's just like gently kind of, you know, guiding him away. Um, now here with Kafani as well, we're seeing a couple of different things with, with how people are perceiving Jesus throughout the season. There are many people, for example, the tent city who are very excited about seeing Jesus. They're very excited about being with him and learning from him. And, 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 you know, they basically, they believe that he's the Messiah. Then there are a bunch of people on the other side who are like, ah, he's, he seems to be a good teacher, but I don't think he's the Messiah. I think there's something wrong here. Right. Then we have like the Pharisees who have a perception of him, uh, depending on what side they're on. Right. And then also we have people like Kofni who believe that he's a sorcerer, believe that he is, um, he's melding the minds, right? Like he's, he's casting a spell on people in order to get them to follow him. Uh, and so Kofni is falling into this now where he's seeing Jesus as a fraud. He's seeing Jesus as um, a false prophet. He's seeing him as a sorcerer rather than the Messiah. Uh, Cause that's the only way Rama would follow him is if he had cast some sort of spell on her. Right. And he may mean that literally, he may mean that figuratively, uh, but here definitely he has a bad perception of Jesus, especially after his daughter dies. But even before that, you know, he was not keen uh, to kind of go through all of this for sure. 
But before we get to that, I want to invite you to go to Israel with us. I know that these videos are great and you're learning a lot through this series, but there is nothing like being there in person and seeing exactly what happens in Israel, what there is, what there is to learn and the people to meet, the food to eat, everything. This next trip that I've planned is the cheapest that I can possibly get these trips. Normally they're five or six or $7,000, but my trip here is less than $4,000. We'd love for you to be a part of it. And if you can at all sign up, there's a link down in the description down below, or you can take your phone's camera and point it at this QR code and it'll take you directly to the site. From there, you can check out our brochure and see exactly what we're doing. And you can even save your spot with a $500 deposit. As you're seeing here, we had some of the most amazing moments in our last trip to Israel, and we'd love for you to be part of the next one. So don't wait, sign up today. Spots are limited as always. And let's get back to the video. Let's go. I curse you and your followers. Let me go back real fast. There's something that I wanted to point out, and I think we skipped by it. So I want to talk about this real fast. One second. Let's play through this section. Dangerous. Then why is my daughter dead? Dead. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. You've already killed me, Tomas. And then you went and killed her. So this line here points to something that I talked to uh, a few episodes ago for episode one and for episode two and three as we get into what Ramos and Thomas's relationship was doing. So Kofni here, in case you missed it, he says, um, you've already killed me and then you went and killed her. So what is he talking about here? Well, we talked about in episode one for Rayma to leave her family and to do all these things. She would have had to basically tell her town and tell her father, you're dead to me. Right. So I think that's what Kofni is referencing here. You've already killed me, meaning my daughter basically treated me as if I was nothing. She treated me as if I was dead anyway. Now you've killed her as well. So it's like a, it's a, you know, two punch move here for him. And he's, he's not feeling well, obviously, uh, obviously this is a horrible thing that Kofni is going through. And because not only did his daughter reject him as a father, but now she's also lost her life and there's no way for them to reconcile. So this is a, this is a really, really hard thing uh, for them, for sure. Let me uh, move forward here. Let's go. I curse you and your followers. We grieve with you. Yeah, I love the the kind of talk back points here. He says, I curse you and your followers. Big James says, we grieve with you. He's trying to be kind and and we're not seeing them lash out like we've seen previously, right? Especially Big James, uh, very prone to lashing out towards someone that attacks uh, anything that's going on uh, with, the, with the group. I will spread the word far and wide. As long as blood runs in my veins, I will move mountains to expose you, Jesus of Nazareth. I will make sure the world knows you are a liar and a murderer. You have made your feelings clear. Same thing with Simon Z here. He's trying to protect and just walk away and make sure that Jesus is safe, but also just get out of the situation because obviously they're not going to be welcomed into Teldor. Now, Kofni obviously is at his breaking point as well. He is completely losing it at this point, and he is saying, he's vowing, right? He's making it his life's mission to make sure that the ministry of Jesus does not succeed. This gives us a huge hint as to how Kofni will be used in the future. We'll leave you in peace. You will see me again. And when you do, it will be the last thing you see. I love that little look. Kofni, like, he kind of gets scared. He's like, oh, no, did I go too far? He said no more. So he says no more and then Kofni is left standing there. Now let's look at some scripture here because obviously there's some stuff that I think Kofni could be a part of in the future. And obviously a lot of you have guessed it already. I think a big part of what Kofni is going to do is this section of scripture right here. Now we're in Matthew chapter 27. This is verse 15 where we're kind of starting here. But of course, during the trial of Jesus, which this would be during season six. So we're a couple seasons away from this. I could definitely see Kofni being one of those main people that 
that we're going to see, at least in that scene, who shouts out for Jesus to be crucified rather than Barabbas. Now, let's read through part of this real fast, and then we're going to go through another section of this episode because I think it's really, really cool. But let's read this first. Now, at the feast, uh, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd uh, any one prisoner whom whom they wanted, and they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered Pilate's... uh, when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, uh, who is called the Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word for him to have nothing to do with the righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now, the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. I could see this playing out exactly like we've seen before. I could see people like Shmuel or people like um, Yanni or people like Caiaphas or or uh, Shammai, right? Persuading the crowd, Gadara, who you haven't met yet, or you have met in this season, but very, very uh, briefly. Um, and so people like that who are going to basically persuade the crowd and say, hey, uh, you know, we should vote for Barabbas instead of Jesus. And they, they start teaching while Jesus is in custody so that Jesus can't refute them. And then some people begin to get on their side. And then Kofni also helps with this, right? Saying that how Jesus killed his daughter and things like that, right? I could definitely see that happening. Um, and then they ask, which of the two uh, do you want the released? Uh, and they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, are you sure? <laughs> Basically. <laughs> and then they said, let him be crucified. And of course we hear in other, ver- in other versions, they say, crucify him, crucify him. Uh, and, uh, and that's, that's where it's at. So I think that definitely we could see this scene play out. Um, I would be surprised if we don't see this happen actually. Now, last week I'll clarify as well, before we jump back into this episode, at, during the after show, actually, Dallas talks about Rama and her resurrection. It looks like that's actually not going to happen. Dallas says that he's not going to do the resurrection from the book of Matthew. Uh, he's not going to show that during this whole uh, portion here. I wonder why he's choosing not to do that at all. Maybe there's not a good enough writing point for him to jump into it there. Um, I did think it would, it would be really, really cool if we did see her again, but it, it really looks like we're not going to see Rama again unless Dallas is just bluffing us completely. So let's continue on the episode there's some really cool things that i want to jump into here so let's go rough for cotton coffee for sure i'm gonna put this mu- uh this music down because sometimes copyright can be an issue here on uh on this stuff we get a black screen and this whole sequence right here is really interesting to me this is really the first time in a while i mean we got we got a sort of something like this in season three but this is the first time in a while we see a sequence of events that brings us way further in time than we were previously so again i've done a timeline on the chosen me and david tate have spent I don't know, probably dozens and dozens of hours going over the timeline for the chosen. And some parts of it are just weird and wrong. However, there is a mistake that's coming up that I'm going to talk about uh, where they get the date wrong here. However, um, and that's verified, by the way, (laughs) it's not just me saying it. I've actually talked to, to the chosen team and to Dallas about this, but, um, here we're seeing for the first time, Zebedee is delivering olive oil to Jerusalem. So the ladies and Zebedee are taking this cart to Jerusalem. That's what you see on the top uh, section there. Then in the bottom section, you see, it says Jesus is the Christ or Jesus is Messiah on the bottom section there. So this is the first time we're really seeing Zebedee deliver this oil to Jerusalem, which is really, really cool. He talks about it being for the high priest, but I, but I didn't understand that he was not just selling it to Capernaum. He was also selling it to the high priest in Jerusalem, which is very, very cool. Uh, and so that's awesome. They actually get money for this, which we're going to see in the next scene. So they deliver that oil there. Then we see Mary and Tamar come back in Capernaum. This is Andrew's house to Judas here, who is now calculating all the money as the bookkeeper, of course. Um, And so we see him, you know, kind of looking at the money, maybe a little bit pensive, maybe a little bit of foreshadowing there. This scene I really, really love. We see some lambs on the side of the road. We see the disciples uh, and Jesus obviously going down the road, but we also see a ton of other followers. This is what we've been missing for so long from so many other places. There were people like this that followed Jesus everywhere right? So wherever this is, I don't know where this is supposed to be in in the biblical story, but 
all of his apostles and all these other people, there's probably like nearly a hundred people here that are following Jesus. Maybe, maybe 50. I can't really see fully, but there's a bunch of extra people here that are following Jesus. And this would have happened everywhere, possibly in the hundreds, possibly even in the thousands at times that would walk with Jesus and just listen to him and, and learn from him as he went, because they truly believed that he was the Messiah or at least someone special, right? So it's really, really interesting to see this large, large group of people uh, following him here, which we've never really seen before uh, like this. There's a donkey back there too. I need to go look and see if this is the same donkey uh, that we see later on. <laughs> and uh, if it's the same donkey from season five uh, that we've seen in the behind the scenes, because that'd be funny if it is. Now, this is obviously a demon-possessed man. I saw a lot of people talking about, is this Legion? I don't think this is Legion, um, because Legion happens near a place called Corsi, Corsi and also uh, kind of down the road from Corsi. Corsi is the location in Israel where it's kind of traditionally thought that this happened, but there are no graves at Corsi, so it can't necessarily be right there. It's kind of down the road a bit, uh, nearer to the Sea of Galilee, and closer to some cliffs that are there that jump into the Sea of Galilee. Of course, that's really important because the story of Legion, a man who was possessed by a ton of different demons, basically, uh, Jesus lets out these demons, he puts them into pigs, and then those pigs jump into the Sea of Galilee. I don't think this is him, uh, because one, they're not near any graves. Uh, this isn't a graveyard, this isn't a place with a bunch of tombs. Uh, and so Legion, that's where he was. And, and then also there's no pigs around. So I don't think that this is Legion, but I do think this is just another possessed man uh, that we see here. I don't know if this is... Um, I don't know if this is a particular a particular biblical reference or if this is just supposed to be another random possessed guy that they run into and it's kind of showing this as time is passing. Cuz obviously this is not all in one day, right? <laughs> um this is over a long period of time, probably close to a year of time actually. Uh in between what we just saw in the previous uh, section to uh, to the next section that we're going to get to. Maybe not a year, but a, a pretty long time. Now we're seeing Yusuf come into the Great Sanhedrin. This is in Jerusalem, in the temple in Jerusalem. And so he's uh, obviously going to be involved in that at some point. We, we don't actually see him again in this episode, but it's showing us that he's going to be there. Then we see Thomas on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, right on uh, the dock of Capernaum there. And he is sad. Emo Thomas is here, for sure. Now, this, the next sections that we're seeing here are really interesting. This one, to me in particular, is very interesting. We saw this in the behind the scenes a little over a year ago, and we were really excited to see this guy. If you don't remember him, we have seen this guy before. This is the same actor, the same character, that we saw in the initiated pilot episode of The Chosen. Season one, episode one, this is the same blind man that grabbed Matthew and asked him if he was the Messiah. That's what this character does. He, he sits there in Capernaum and he has his change jar, right, for people to drop coins into. But then he reaches out and he grabs anybody that's close to him in order to ask them if they're the Messiah. And he's been doing this for the last three years at least, right, probably long before then. But now he finally runs into the Messiah here. A lot of people are asking if this is blind Bartimaeus. I don't think we have a clear answer on that. Um, I don't think so, because I think blind Bartimaeus is not in Capernaum, if I remember correctly. So, um, yeah, but we see this moment here. I think it is very key that we see little James here as well, and he's smiling at the healing of this man. Remember, little James is still not healed. He still has the staff. He still has the limp. There's a, a reason why little James is that way, and he sees that other people are meant to be healed, and so he's happy about that. Um, yeah, really, really cool stuff. You can even see him as he's grabbing Jesus, if you rewind a bit, you can actually see him mouthing, uh, are you the Messiah? And so he's given that same line there, even though we don't have any audio from this moment here. And then he sees for the first time, really, really cool stuff there. Now here we see as Kafni is in Teldor, as far as we can tell, that's Teldor. Um, and he is, um, you know, 
gathering support, basically. Uh, he's telling people the story about Rama and Jesus and what's going on and how upset he is, and he's going to be gathering support for something. And now here, this is interesting as well. This is still Capernaum here. We see Jesus as he's teaching. Remember what happened last time Jesus taught in Capernaum uh, in episode three, that it did not turn out well, right? So we still have some of the same characters in this uh, section here where we see obviously a bunch of the apostles are here, a bunch of the followers of Jesus. We have some Pharisees as well. Rabbi Akiva is over to the left, as well as Julius, who is now under the, the command of Praetor Gaius, right? Uh, we see a bunch of other people that are here that are listening to Jesus and, um, but it's a totally different thing than we saw last season, right? We don't see the Romans charging in. We don't see Akiva arguing with him. In fact, the Roman soldier here almost looks like he's looking over Akiva, making sure he doesn't cause any issues for this section here. So I wonder if Gaius asked Julius to keep an eye on Akiva specifically for this teaching here. Uh, but we see obviously all the followers here as uh, Jesus is teaching. And it pans over here. Looks like Julius is just making sure that everybody is safe and that Akiva is not <laughs> jumping in like he did last time because obviously that ended poorly. Now we see here as well, Julius coming to Gaius and he is reporting on Jesus' teachings and what's going on. Quintus obviously was very interested in what was going on with the teachings of Jesus and the gatherings that were happening. Gaius is not so much, right? <laughs> so he gets this report of Jesus having this larger gathering and immediately just burns it, right? <laughs> He's not super interested in, uh, in doing all that. So as we get back into the episode, we are actually in Peter's home and we're going to listen to a portion of this episode, but not the whole thing. So let's jump in here. Or a por portion of the scene. So right there, did you notice that? <laughs> so right here, We've got the month of Kislev, and that is AD 30. This is wrong. So I've talked to Dallas about this. Uh, in fact, I just uh, shot him a text during the live stream because <laughs> I was like, I thought you were going to fix this. So during when, I, when we watched this in theaters, me and David Tate, and I think Brandon Robbins as well, we all had this conversation of this date right here. Um, AD 30... Kislev is November or December of AD 30. Okay. So this does not make sense for the timeline of the chosen or the timeline that they're trying to do for Jesus's ministry. And this should be AD 29. So Kislev, if you don't know, is a Jewish month within the calendar. And so Kislev uh, is basically November, December of AD 30, which means that basically Jesus would have to die um, like right past this. Um, however, it, there is more time that passes in between then, and, and it doesn't make sense for him to die in 31, in AD 31, which is what it would be if this were the date, because they started the show in AD 26. So, um, so it should be AD 29 of Kis, Kislev of AD 29. Sorry, if that doesn't make sense. This should be AD 29 here, uh, because in the show of the chosen, the timeline should be that the crucifixion happens in AD 30. So if this is Kislev of AD 30, this is well past the crucifixion and Jesus, you know, the church would have already been started. We'd be in the, we'd be in the book of acts by now. Okay. Um, yeah. So the, the DVD has this date, the streaming has this date everywhere. I've looked so far has the date. And what happened is I talked to Dallas about it during the theatrical release and um, apparently they tried to change it and something just got missed, I guess. So uh, not a huge deal, but it, but this is the wrong date. Just a heads up. <laughs> and we'll listen to uh, this conversation right here between Peter and Thomas real fast. <laughs> when does he get there with the fruit? Soon. <laughs> So Eden is in this scene. We don't see much of Eden at all in this season, but this is one of the scenes where we get to see her. <laughs> That's what I would have said. <laughs> You're sleeping any better? Better than I was a few months ago. So a few months ago is when they're saying that Rama was um, was killed. So it's been at least a few months. I don't know exactly what that means, but that adds to our timeline there as well. Uh, that we've we've spent a few months kind of traveling around, making money with olive oil, and 
getting you know into the groove of things with Jesus' ministry as they're coming to a close before they go to Jerusalem. So right now, we're about a month away, maybe less, uh, from Holy Week and all that kind of stuff. Not great. Still hungry. Oh, and we had our loss. Well, I guess we're a few months, because if this is the month of Kislev, then we'd be a few months away from, three or four months away from Passover. Took me a few months also. Even even longer. Don't take too much. How are your prayers? Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. I do them. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to mean them sometimes. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. What about leaving? Even you know, just for a short time, getting away. I just can't. It's too painful to be here. And yet, there's no place I'd rather be. So that is basically where Thomas is left at after this whole situation here. Now there's a bunch of stuff that we could go into um, later on with uh, kind of the stuff that happens before talking between Peter and John and big James. Uh, however, I think this is where we're going to end this section right here. There's some great stuff that's going on here. The setup with Kofni into all the, the, the stuff during that time jump there, such good moments there. I love that they did that because it's not something that the chosen does very much, but they needed to waste a bunch of time here <laughs> in this season as the timeline has been totally weird. So it makes sense that they do it here, giving time for Thomas and the group to kind of switch their focus again from Rama back to the mission of what they're doing in the ministry of Jesus. And so. I hope you liked this video, and if you want to see more of the Chosen Season 4 breakdowns or even upcoming Season 5 BTS, then we've got a ton of stuff coming. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel, and we'll see you on the next one. Peace.